Welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast, which can be heard on VHHA.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get podcasts. We're also on the radio each Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, 107.7 FM, and 820 AM across Central Virginia, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.9 FM. Please send any questions, comments, or feedback to pcfpodcast at vhha.com. Again, that's pcfpodcast at vhha.com. And today we're pleased to be joined by Stacey Johnson, the Executive Director of the Riverside Behavioral Health Center, for a conversation about mental health and substance abuse treatment, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on behavioral health providers and patients, and more. And with that, welcome to the program, Stacey. Thank you so much for having me. Great to chat with you. Well, we appreciate it. So let's start with some level setting, Stacey. You've worked in behavioral health care for many years, and, and I'd like to get your perspective on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted people with treatment needs in terms of both demand for care and the resulting impact on system capacity. Available data and research suggests that more Americans than ever are struggling with mental wellness, that overdose deaths here in Virginia have surged in recent years, and that demand for care rose during the pandemic, even as overall utilization of health care services declined. So from your perspective, Stacey, what have you seen in terms of the impact of the pandemic on the general state of mental health here in Virginia? So we are seeing an increased number of folks seeking treatment options. So there's some interesting studies that have been done. So pre-pandemic, about 11% of the population reported signs and or symptoms of anxiety disorders, depression, et cetera. When we fast forward to January, it was about 41% of the United States population that are reporting those symptoms. So that's a significant increase. So we are seeing, of course, the chronically mentally ill continuing to seek treatment. And then additional folks that perhaps were able to get that support on an outpatient basis are also looking for more intensive options. So I think that when we look at our health system as a whole and behavioral health system in Virginia, it's already a bit stretched. So I think a a number of our facilities are looking how we can expand those services to ensure that we're meeting the community need in general. And I appreciate you sharing that perspective, and I want to continue on that theme. I will also point out that we here at the association have also done some public opinion survey research and found Virginians reporting indications of of higher level of, of mental anxiety, as you pointed out. So as we stick on that theme, we know, and you mentioned this, that the pandemic has placed a great strain on staffing in the public and private healthcare sectors. In fact, several state run adult psychiatric hospitals stopped taking admissions last summer due to staffing and capacity issues. For private providers like Riverside and others, I wonder how that decision impacted operations, whether we're talking about things like emergency department boarding, which is patients who come into the system through uh, an encounter with perhaps law enforcement and then they're seen in the emergency department and then uh, they are awaiting a bed or perhaps awaiting a transfer that's unavailable, or just in terms of psychiatric patient volumes, which we talked about a moment ago. Can you tell me how that situation has impacted the system as a whole? Everyone in healthcare is well aware that it really needs to be a safety focus first. So we certainly understand and respect the decision that the state has made. For the patients, we are seeing more folks that are in our emergency department for prolonged periods of time. Many private facilities, much like RBHC, are working at capacity, so we are not able to admit above that. So what that leads to is folks waiting for beds in the emergency department until a private hospital has a dish. Charge. So I think from that perspective, it's certainly impactful. I and mean, I think we're all just doing the best we can to provide the best care as quickly as possible. And I appreciate you sharing that. And certainly, as you mentioned, you know, the challenges that have been presented during the pandemic, whether it's on staffing or whether it's on increased demand for services, they do impact, as you point out, both the public and the private sector. Uh, But those impacts, as we know, place strain across the continuum of care. So that's great perspective from you there, Stacey. People who are new to this topic may not be aware of the evolution of federal and state public policy over the years that has led to the point here in Virginia where private hospitals are now handling about 90% of the combined voluntary and involuntary behavioral health inpatient admissions each year. There's broad agreement that the current situation is challenging for both public and private sector providers, who each, as we just mentioned, have staffing challenges and resource challenges. As we look to new approaches, hospitals like Riverside Regional Medical Center and others have sought state support for pilot programs, such as your partial hospitalization program. PHP is an outpatient day treatment program where patients can 
reside in their own homes while having access to an entire suite of hospital-based uh, support, whether for addiction or behavioral health care treatment and therapy services, as well as other support services like education and lifestyle support. So I wonder, Stacy, if you can tell us about that program and how it and perhaps other models can help supplement existing inpatient acute care behavioral health treatment options for both adolescents and adults. So I think the first thing that's most important to focus on is the continuum of care. So in Virginia, we have gotten to a place where we have inpatient beds, but that full continuum of care isn't available. And what I mean by that is essentially starting off with inpatient, stepping down to a partial hospital program, which is essentially day treatment, then stepping down to an intensive outpatient program, and then general outpatient services. The most success in addiction treatment and behavioral health, for that matter, are found when somebody works through the full continuum of care. So that's what we're really focusing on at Riverside. So what we said first is, okay, we've got to get our detox underway. So we put a big focus um, in the last year on, on detox and building that service. So then folks could step down into a PHP or IOP. We did open up an intensive outpatient program this past September. And then the final leg of of that is our addictions partial hospital program. And like I said, that's really day treatment. It's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. where folks come in and really get that holistic care, the individualized specialty treatment that has a wide variety of offerings. Um, Each patient receives their own treatment plan. Uh, We focus on coping skills, role playing. We also offer rec therapy, art therapy, spirituality, medication education from a pharmacist, etc. really during the course of that day to start the stability in the community. So that's our goal is how can we help people be successful at a lower level of care as opposed to just inpatient. So I think really utilizing these opportunities for pilots to build the continuum of care is where we're going to see a lot of long-term success within our state. It's great to hear that Riverside has been a leader in this kind of innovation and this kind of approach. And as you point out, I mean, this really is, whether we're talking about the continuum of care or we're talking about all the stakeholders, uh, this needs to be a comprehensive strategy because obviously clinicians and caregivers are very central to getting patients the care they need. But this impacts so many other folks, whether it's patients and families or whether it's law enforcement personnel who sometimes are called in in these situations and involved in the transport of patients to clinical settings, whether it's the CSBs, the community service boards, uh, and so many other folks. It takes and requires a comprehensive approach because so many stakeholders are involved in this process. And that's one of the things that the association and its members have continued to work with through the General Assembly and with other policymaking partners to try to emphasize this this comprehensive approach. And so it's good to hear that Riverside really is looking at this uh, from a continuum of care perspective. And I do want to point out that Riverside and other private providers offer a diverse range of addiction and behavioral health care services along the lines of what you just mentioned, Stacey. It's also important, though, to recognize that each provider has different in-house capabilities and areas of specialization within the behavioral health space. One program that comes to mind is an example of a, this is a non-Riverside hospital, but it's in Virginia. It's located in a military community that has a program focused on the specific mental health treatment needs that military members and veterans may need, and it has staff with specialized training to support that care. And I mentioned that to illustrate that different patients obviously are unique and have different needs and different programs are likewise equipped with staff and processes that may be ideally situated to address certain patient needs. So I wonder, Stacey, if you can just, for the awareness of people who are listening to this, speak to that notion that when we talk about behavioral health, there's a lot of variation even under that heading and different programs have different clinicians uh, with different kinds of specialization to serve different patient populations with different needs. I think that you touched base on on something that's really important to highlight is that we need more than one organization in our state to provide these services. Certainly, there's more than enough patients to go around. So I think that that's really important to mention as well is we as a state need to build all of these services together. And there are hospitals that have specialty focuses, which is really critical because everyone's needs are very different. It's just like if somebody were to go to physical therapy, that individual's care point is very different than the next person that's seen an hour later. So I think if we can all come together and and develop our specialties, that's what's really important. So I think we see everything from the, you know, chronically mentally ill folks with, you know, those pervasive mental illnesses to what we're seeing, I think, more recently is folks 
like you or I, that are fairly successful, but but really have lacked that support system in the community, as well as the pandemic impacting them from, you know, a financial standpoint or career standpoint. So I think it is really important to be mindful of everyone's individual needs. And I think that that's what we're really working towards. And I appreciate you sharing that. And and since you mentioned the individual, I now have two individual questions for you that are a little more lighthearted now that we've talked about some of the formal topical stuff. The first one, Stacey, is this. In the hypothetical scenario that you could anticipate your final day on Earth, what would your last meal be? Oh, no. So I would say something involving cheese. So I am a bit of a cheese addict. And if there's just a plate of all different kinds of cheese, I'm in. Okay. Sounds like a charcuterie plate. (laughs) <laughs> and then to close us out, Stacy, uh, this is a question we ask all of our guests on the podcast. If you were stranded on a deserted island, what one book, one album, and one movie would you take with you to keep yourself company? We will spot you a copy of the religious text of your choice. So other than that, what are your three entertainment survival kit picks? Well, I would say my honest response is if I was on a deserted island with a beach, I don't need a book or an album. I just need the ocean and the waves. That's okay. what honestly would make me the happiest. That the beach is my happy place. Okay. Well, that works for us. Well, listen, with that, that's going to bring us to the close <laughs> of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you like what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so that you know when new episodes are available. We want to once again thank our guest, Stacey Johnson, with Riverside Health System for being with us today. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me.